Hello, citizens of Earth, and welcome back to my garage. Yes, unfortunately, there is a life support issue up on station 204, so I can't go to it, but that is not going to stop the news at all. In fact, Ryan is going to be covering some records. I've got some probe preparation, and Dr. Tamith Escove is going to be talking our space weather and how it affects those probes that are going to be on their way to Mars. Now, before we get started, just of course, want to remind you, if you like what we do here at Tomorrow, don't forget to like us, subscribe to us, hit that notification bell, share us everywhere you can, because every little bit helps us out. Now, let's jump right in it because we have got your tomorrow news for the week of July 23rd, 2020. And Ryan, turn it around. Four of the five astronauts currently aboard the International Space Station have all taken part in testing the comfort factors of the Dragon Endeavour spacecraft in order to show how it can be used for longer missions. And while all of that has been happening in space, back down here, on the land, we're still waiting for the next launch of Starlink and those black sky satellites. The second launch of the B1058 booster carrying the Anasis 2 satellite into orbit from Space Launch Complex 40 has taken to the sky. Everything launched off of that pad, excluding the second stage and of course the payload has been successfully recovered, being the booster and both of the fairings. The South Korean's military communications satellite was successfully placed into orbit after two burns of the second stage, which should start to deorbit itself shortly. The launch of the B-1058 booster marks the quickest recovery of a booster in SpaceX history at only 51 days. This finally beats the shortest amount of time it has taken to get a space shuttle back into space, where the record was set by Space Shuttle Atlantis between STS-51J and the STS-61B missions, her first two missions, which took 54 days. If the Seocon 1B mission launches when it is meant to, then this record will be slashed down by 9 days to a record of 42 days between launches. It's not quite the 24 hours Elon Musk was hoping for, but it certainly is progress. Starlink have started asking for specific addresses of people willing to find out when they can get a connection to the internet satellite service, while the design for the antennas, the UFO on a stick, has been found in the code of the website. These UFOs on sticks have been previously seen in Boca Chica, where we are going next. Not much, as a relative term, has been happening in the southern Texas settlement this past week, however, some new starships have been under construction. Nose cones have been constructed, tanks have been spotted, and some old bulkhead sections have been scrapped. But other than that, not much has happened. But I can sense that we are not too far away from that, you guessed it, 150 meter hop. Thanks, Ryan. In our next Tomorrow News episode, we'll be doing a deep dive into all three of the Mars missions setting off in the 2020 window. Two are currently en route to Mars, but here in the United States, even with COVID-19 cases rising rapidly, NASA is in the final stages of prep work on Perseverance. And the rover is really living up to its name, having to persevere through problems that have had absolutely nothing to do with the rover. In May, equipment to move the Atlas V's solid strap-on boosters needed some TLC. Then during a wet dress rehearsal in June, problems with a sensor line in the liquid oxygen system was found. And then came several confirmed COVID-19 cases. Medical privacy laws don't allow distribution of the information as to who exactly was infected, but United Launch Alliance, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and the Kennedy Space Center's Payload Hazardous Serving Facility were all affected. But Perseverance is now sitting atop its Atlas V booster and is currently set for launch at 1150 Universal Time on July 30th. Well, let's go ahead and jump right into space traffic. On July 15th at 1346 Universal Time, a Northrop Grumman Minotaur IV left the pad at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia with the NROL-129 payload with the United States' National Reconnaissance Office. The Minotaur IV is a four-stage solid-fueled motor launch vehicle that uses motors left over from the United States Air Force's retired Peacekeeper nuclear ballistic missiles. And NASA Space Flight's Chris Gerbhardt had a 
stay cool as hell fact, which is that the first three solid motors on the segments for July 15th launch, they were poured between 1988 and 1990. That means that rocket was just as old as I am. That's pretty wild. Now, as is customary of NRO launches, live coverage ended several minutes after liftoff and the NRO declared mission success for the classified payload making orbit several hours later. Popping over to Japan, the first of three Mars probes planned for this launch window began its journey, lifting off at 2158 Universal Time on July 19th from the Tangashima Space Center. Riding on a Mitsubishi Heavy Industries H2A launch vehicle is Al Amal, meaning hope, and is the Arab world's first interplanetary mission, being headed up by the United Arab Emirates. After a successful insertion into a parking orbit by the second stage, it relit its engine and carried Hope up to the proper velocity for a successful trans-Mars injection. All systems were confirmed to be operating on Hope, and it's now set to cruise until its Mars arrival in February of 2021. The roar of Hydrolox engines at full song made themselves heard in China at the Wencheng Space Launch Center as the Long March 5 rocket, China's largest booster, lifted off at 0441 Universal Time on July 23rd, carrying the Tianwen-1 Mars mission. A triple combo of an orbiter, lander, and rover, this is certainly China's most ambitious robotic mission to date. An hour after launch, confirmation of a successful trans-Mars injection, burn, and separation of Tianwen-1 from the upper stage was delivered. Arrival at Mars is planned for February 2021, and the lander and rover possibly heading to Mars surface as soon as April 2021. Lifting off at 1426 Universal Time on July 23rd, a Russian Soyuz 2.1A rocket helped progress MS-15 begin its journey to the International Space Station, carrying roughly 2,800 kilograms of fuel, air, water, and supplies. A picture-perfect ascent provided by the Soyuz 2.1A booster allowed for spectacular onboard views, especially during deployment of Progress MS-15 and its upper stage that placed it into its preliminary parking orbit, venting propellants overboard. A three-hour fast rendezvous with the International Space Station was on the docket, and all was well until 60 seconds before docking when Progress MS-15's attitude began to move out of alignment. Russian cosmonaut Anatoly Ivanishin asked Mission Control at the Korolev Space Center in Moscow if he needed to take manual control, but the automatic system's onboard Progress MS-15 kicked in and it got back on track for an accurate docking at 17.45 Universal Time. And here are your upcoming launches. And for this week's space weather, here's Dr. Tamitha Scope. We have barely calmed down from a solar storm that gave us some decent aurora last week, but the show's not over, so we can't rest on our laurels. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see there are not a lot of bright regions on the Earth-facing disk right now, but right around the 18th and into the 19th, we got a stealthy solar storm launch from the northern hemisphere. This one is partially Earth-directed, and it could give us a glancing blow right around the 23rd and into the 24th, which is not necessarily necessarily good news for that Chinese Mars mission that's going to be launched right around the same time. Now, meanwhile, we also have a coronal hole that's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone right about the same time. And if it enhances that kind of glancing blow from that solar storm, who knows, we might actually get another chance for some aurora. Now, that's not the only story, because if you kind of see the glow on the east limb of the sun, well, that is a new active region that's going to be rotating into Earth view over the next couple days and as we switch to our front or our far-sighted sun this is stereo a's view and it's looking at the sun pretty much from the side you can see that region and it's been firing some uh solar flares and maybe possibly even a small solar storm or so as it's rotating into stereo's view but as we continue to watch it it has calmed down it doesn't look like it's any risk for radio blackouts which is good news for space traffic and launch comms for the upcoming mars missions that should be launched in just what the next week or so but it does look like it will be boosting the solar flux for emergency responders and amateur radio operators so you can enjoy some decent radio propagation and now for your leo meo geo orbit outlook
As we switch to our low energy particle environment, these are the particles that cause charging on the outside of the spacecraft, including the solar arrays, that then can discharge and cause electrical short circuits. You can see the fluxes remain pretty low. We have calmed down from that solar storm that hit us just this past week, and it was right in time, too, because we just had that launch right on the 20th. Now, this is going to continue, hopefully, for the next few days. We are seeing more injections. You can see them in red here. These are particle injections from Earth's night side, but it's remaining, the fluxes aren't being all that intensified and it's remaining pretty much in the geo environment. So this is good news for some upcoming launches. We do have two more launches on to Mars and the last thing we'd want to see is any disruptions of these spacecraft or having them go into safe mode. For more details on this week's space weather, including that Earth-directed solar storm and how it might affect the launches to Mars, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. You know what time it is? Yep, you guessed correctly. It's time for this week's Spaceflight Bonanza. Where's, where's the rest of this? Two spacewalks occurred on the International Space Station, one on July 16th, the other on July 21st, both performed by NASA astronauts Chris Cassidy and Bob Benkin. The July 16th walk finalized and wrapped up a major upgrade of the station's battery systems, now completely devoid of the old nickel hydrogen cells and using new lithium ion batteries. Now enough work was completed during that excursion that July 21st was dedicated to preparing the outside of the station for the upcoming nano Rack's Bishop Airlock, which will be delivered on the upcoming SpaceX CRS-21 mission and used as a commercial platform for egress and ingress of research payloads that need exposure to the space environment. Now we knew it was coming, but that doesn't make it any easier. The James Webb Space Telescope's launch has been delayed. A scheduled slip of seven months has pushed it back to October 31st, 2021. Although it's not the telescope's fault, work slowdowns due to procedures in place to help with the COVID-19 pandemic are to blame. Program managers are not expecting any additional budget needs to cover the delay, and several tests are coming up that will confirm that the fully assembled telescope is prepared and ready to to take the forces of an Ariane 5 launch. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's Hayabusa 2 mission is on schedule to wrap up its asteroid sample return mission this year with the return canister filled with bits of asteroid Ryugu on track to land back on Earth on December 6th. The sample return capsule will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at 43,000 kilometers an hour and come down for a landing under parachute in the Woomera prohibited area in South Australia. Now, after locating the sample canister, it will be retrieved and taken to Japan, where it will be opened once it's inside of an ultra-clean laboratory for study. Now, last week we talked a little bit about Comet Neowise, and did any of you actually get out and see it? because I did in the evening skies, and if you did, let us know in the comments below what you did, what you saw, and how you went about doing it. And if you took some really cool photos, send them to us via our Twitter account, at T-M-R-O, and we'll feature them in next week's news episode. And that reminds me, I wanna thank all of you who helped contribute to the shows of tomorrow. I may be thanking you, but trust me, Ryan, Tamitha, Jamie, Carrie Ann, Dutta, the whole squad of us here at Tomorrow have an indescribable level of appreciation for your support. We can't do this without you. Everything we do is because of you. So make sure to thank yourself as well. And if you'd like to join in and become a citizen contributing to the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join and check out the levels and rewards that you get, such as Escape Velocity, which is a channel you'll get access to in our Discord server, and I've been dipping in there quite a few times to get input for the show from Tomorrow Citizens, so check it out and thank you for your support. And that's Seco 8 for this edition of Tomorrow News. Don't forget, next week, we are going to be talking in depth about that trifecta of missions that are heading to Mars in our current launch window. So thank you so much for watching us this week. And remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep exploring. Delta Flight 1188 from Atlanta. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Also, that's my dog, Missy. Missy! Shh!
Hey, what are you doing? Hey, little doggy, what you doing? You know what time it is? Yep, we got a whole lot of little stories headed your way with this space flight bonanza. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever done.